again, he is a pen tester and security consultant with Stanton and Associates. He's on the advanced pen testing team over there. Um, and he's going to be talking about uh, <laughs> SQLNet. And for those of you all not familiar with SQLNet, you're about to learn. Chris. <laughs> all right. Thanks, guys. Um, I feel like there's a bit of explanation that needs to, uh, um, there needs to be a little bit of a, a backstory here. Um, so last year, the Information Warfare Summit um, uh, was helping uh, organize it, uh, and there's some really great folks over there. And I uh, offered my uh, basics, my SQL injection basics conversation, um, or talk, uh, just, just titled uh, SQL Injection, um, Hack to Basics. And when I got there on the day of the con, it was back when we could actually do things in person, uh, there were a bunch of posters up, and uh, I was slated to speak on SQLNet. I don't know what SQLNet is. I've never heard of SQLNet. Uh, it is the thing, actually. We figured it out. Uh, some weird uh, uh, Oracle uh, tool. But everywhere posted on all the posters, uh, it said I was going to talk on SQLNet that day. Uh, it was in the handouts, of the brochures, everything. And um, we made it work. You know, I, I think people were... There was some extra interest because of the SQLNet uh, talk. They're like, what is that? I need to know. Um, so today, I'm giving SQLNet version two. We're going to go the more ed advanced piece. So we're going to really dig in deep. Um, I've added a lot of information. We do need to briefly cover some of the basics to those who have not done SQL injection before. Um, and I've been told if I don't hold my mic out, you guys can hear my shirt. And I'm sure the shirt doesn't sound too great. Um, so. Uh, but there's a lot of pieces that we're going to cover. We're going to go quick through the, uh, the basics. Uh, this is basically a follow-up to last year's talk. Um, so we're going to briefly touch on these, and then we're going to get some, uh, some of the more in-depth pieces. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right. Okay. And, yep, we're good. Okay. A uh, little bit about me. I am a penetration tester for an auditing firm, Stennett and Associates here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, before that, uh, I worked as a penetration tester for True Digital Security. Really great folks. Aaron is actually over there. Um, uh, I miss him every day. But uh, really great folks over at True. Um, they do a lot of uh, additional pieces beyond auditing, um, security testing services, as well as um, IT services, so if you're needy, in need of that. Anyways, coming back to me, before that, I was a freelance developer. Um, and to those who came over from my talk 15 minutes ago, you're gonna hear some repeats. But yeah, I was a developer, uh, worked for two years as a developer on my own, and uh, made a lot of mistakes as I was uh, writing my applications. Made a lot of mistakes that then became a obsession to try and fix. I wanted to be able to fix these, these issues as best as possible. And, and as, I, uh, as it became continued being a uh, obsession, that I continued going down that route and it actually turned into a career where I joined on with True Digital Security and uh, really got to explore my interest in application security. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of pieces, a lot of fundamentals uh, that must be covered as a pen tester, but application security is one of those focuses. And you're actually watching as red teaming is breaking into all these various um, individual uh, silos of knowledge and there's network pen testing, there's uh, physical pen testing, and there's application security testing or pen testing, if, if you uh, came from the last talk, that can be focused on. And before that, I was an IT guy uh, for over 10 years, so you know, this is definitely not my first radio. I've been around for quite a while. Um, I've got some fancy letters uh, behind my name. Um, recently added the, the, the CISP. Um, no, the, it's, it's, it's good to be going down that route, but uh, you know, I think I lose points for, for going that route and, uh, and uh, having a little bit of uh, that management background. But it's good to be able to talk that language, to be able to uh, both operate at the techie level and to be able to talk to people, um, especially when you're giving a report, uh, you're giving a debrief, uh, and you're, you're um, working with people that, uh, that may be at the, um, at the board level. Uh, they may be the seat suite level. You need to have that, be able to have that conversation with them uh, and feel comfortable doing that. And I really feel that uh, the CISSP really geared me up for that. Okay. Okay, so everything we're going to cover today can be used for malicious purposes. You should not. That is not what the, the goal of this talk is about. Um, yes, you can do these things and you can do it for educational purposes, but you need to have control of the things you're testing or you need to be authorized by those that do have control, 
those that, that do own the equipment, own the, the software, the systems, uh, need to give you that authorization, authorization to do that. It's very important. If you use some of the, uh, the techniques that we've, we covered today on systems that don't belong to you, you can be charged with federal crimes. So please, please make sure you own or, or, or have the authority to perform this testing. Um, uh, I don't want anything that anybody uses here to be used against them to send them to jail. Okay, we're gonna talk about a couple different things. These first two, SQL injection attack types, where we're introduce, introducing you to the basics and the parameterized queries, which is a strategy for defeating these. We're gonna go through this quickly because that's a, that's a lot of repeat from before. Then we're gonna get into injection strategies. What do you do when you have injections? And that is where the really interesting stuff happens. Okay, so what is SQL injection? SQL injection is the act of, um, so you have uh, an application that needs to take in the username and the password, run it against the database and see if they are who they are. If it's true, go ahead and let them log in. So in this case, uh, we're selecting the ID and the username from user table where the username equals whatever's passed to it and the password also equals whatever's passed to it. So it's doing this check, go get chip and this password right here. And these get inputted here. What the developers didn't think about um, initially when, when crafting SQL uh, is what, what happens when we, we put in these bizarre, uh, these other SQL commands in here, these SQL clauses, and how is the application going to respond to those? Um, and so really, the, now the SQL query, when it receives this blah with a single quote, or one equals one, limit one, when it, this comes in, this, this is telling the application, okay, I, or the, the SQL string, the query, uh, I want you to do this, and then stop what you're doing. So we have a, a single quote here, and or if one equals one, then go ahead. Uh, and since one equals one uh, uh, is evaluated as true, and it's executed uh, before the or, which is just Boolean logic, then all the rows and the tables are returned, except we have this limit one, which limits it back down to one, so we don't crash our application. All right. So in SQL injection, um, the whole idea is that we're trying to use um, untrusted data that is being performed against databases uh, via what we call string building. That's a very important concept. We have to be able to build strings. We're gonna cover that here in a second. Um, additionally, um, we, once we, these commands are run, that we're trying to inject it directly into the application, uh, there's a couple of different ways we're gonna cover to, to actually make that happen. Uh, and then once you actually have this injection, you're able to run SQL commands. You're able to run as the SQL server. You're running as the context of that application account. What, what does that mean? That means that whatever, whoever is authenticating to SQL, or maybe you're even operating as the SQL uh, database server, you're able to operate a given the uh, permissions on the underlying infrastructure, the systems, you're able to operate with those permissions. And uh, this one is uh, the number one risk in the OAuth top 10 for a very good reason. So how do we detect SQL injection? Okay, so, the, most, uh, the easiest way is to send a single quote. Se uh, SQL it will expect a string when it sees a single quote. So if you send a single quote and you get an error, uh, or any kind of SQL specific syntax, maybe you do the single quote and then the syntax, um, you can actually cause some interesting uh, behavior. Another way to do it is uh, Boolean conditions, such as um, uh, sending a statement that is going to evaluate as true or false. So we can, we can actually, um, we can actually uh, uh, get interesting behavior. Uh, we can introduce time delays and other pieces that will um, indicate that, such as out of band communications, uh, will, will indicate that we're actually telling the SQL server what to do. We're no longer operating within the bounds of what the application designers wanted us to do. We're operating outside. And what I mean by out of band is I could tell the SQL server, go pull this data from another server, a server that I control, evil.com. So go pull that information from there and uh, send that information back um, and giving us an indication. If we don't get all these other indicators, then we can get out of band and we know, hey, that guy's listening. Okay, first order SQL injection comes from direct interaction. I send a request, the server responds, done. Transaction's done. That is, that is first order. That's the one that we're most familiar with if you've seen it. Second order is a little bit inter more interesting. The commands are run later. So at that point, we can 
um, we can go inject malicious content and then go retrieve it later. Um, so it won't execute initially, but it will execute later. So, uh, and once you put the data in the database, almost all databases trust the data in the database, uh, which is, uh, uh, has its own security implications by itself. Um, and so we can put this malicious data in the, uh, C in the SQL database and then be able to call upon it with commands and be able to take advantage of, and like you can add it, you might have filters that say, no, you can't add anything that does this. Well, what if I add these, these words letter by letter and the filters are, you know, it's just a letter, you know, it's just gonna concatenate it onto the, the records that are in there. Um, so at that point, they don't, they don't see it as a problem and you can just add it in and be able to get a second order SQL injection, which is actually far harder to catch than a first order SQL injection. Okay, we need to talk about string building. Again, this is, th these are SQL injection basics or SQL net injection basics. Uh, so string building, and for the eagle eyes in here, you'll actually notice that there's one little uh, piece in here that doesn't hurt it, but doesn't need to be in here. So what is string building? Here's a SQL query. We have select everything from the users where email equals whatever the email is passed into it, that parameter, I'm sorry, that uh, value. And then the password equals, uh, must equal the MD5 of the password that was passed into it. So here we go, let's do a SQL injection. Uh, the emails, I may not know of anybody's e email addresses, so I'll just give it some uh, stuff that looks like an email. And then here, this is where the actual SQL injection is occurring. Uh, we have this single quote. We have a, a parenthesis, and we have or one equals one, dash, dash. There's the, there's a little guy that actually doesn't need to be there, but this is a really great uh, way of looking at this, so I love using the slide. Um, so what this means is it then processes the, the, the string as, select everything from the users where email equals this and password equals the MD5, the hash of what's in here. So we are opening and closing uh, this, this information. So this single quote matches this single quote. We fill something in there, it doesn't matter what's in there. We close the single quote. And in this case, we have to close the parentheses and we say, or one equals one dash dash. The dash dash is uh, read as a comment. So it means anything after this, ignore. So at that point, if there's more to the string, we'll just, we'll just ignore it. We'll just do what I told you. Um, and so this get evalu it is evaluated. Select everything from users where false, because we got the wrong email, and false, um, because we got the, the password wrong, the MD5 of the password, but we did get the true. And the true is evaluated, so or one equals one is true. Remember, trues are evaluated before falses um, uh, in any of these uh, comparisons. So this really evaluates down to, we drop one of the falses. False or true is always true. Then we have select everything where false or true again, which gets evaluated as true. So select everything from the users where true. That will give us the entire users table. Give us every record. Okay, we're gonna go kind of quick here. So um, this is just a recap. This is a way of um, doing what's called stacked queries, where I'm sending this information over more than once. Um, and a stacked query is where I, I have my injection uh, point, which I'm sending over, go get me this ID, user ID of 105. Stop what you're doing and also run this command, drop the table suppliers. And at this point, here's how the uh, SQL query now appears. You see this new information and at this point, well, yeah, it's gonna return 105 and it's also gonna drop all the suppliers. And that's a really big issue. So um, you can do, you can do stack queries and you can do really crazy stuff once you have stack queries working. Okay, what's the risk? If you're, uh, if you're a developer, if you're a blue team, you need to know why you need to stop these things. If you're a security tester, you need to know what you can do with these things. Um, so data retrieval, is probably one of the bigger ones. Um, let's say uh, it's an environment protected by uh, HIPAA regulations. So at that point, if I retrieve somebody's private information, that's a really big issue. Um, I mean, it, it would be a big issue um, just about anywhere else, but HIPAA uh, uh, has such privacy concerns that we really need to make sure that we stay, that we stay safe on that. But we can do even more than data retrieval. We can modify data. Uh, once we modify data, we can hide information. I'm sorry, we're going to remove information. We can change account balances. Um, this also has a SOX imp uh, implication, Sarbanes-Oxley. You need to make sure that uh, the integrity of the data uh, is true. So when you present that to um, public account, I'm sorry, uh, uh, the public uh, and the stakeholders, that that information is known to be uh, known to be um, uh, the integrity of the information has been kept um, secure the whole time and has not been altered. 
But you can also do some uh, database level uh, exploits where we can start operating as the database. And so while these affect the data specifically, this has to do with now I'm using your database against you. I'm attacking you from your database, which is uh, very problematic. Okay, injection points. We can inject in the where clause. Select ID and username from the user table. Where, user equals user and password equals password. Most common one. We have in, where we select some information, where the call name, and then we pass in another uh, uh, SQL statement that goes and retrieves this information. And then, so we have a query out of another query, but this works perfectly fine because now we can attack inside the, the query. So an in can be attacked and we have unions. So we're reunion, unioning, we're, we're combining two different tables together to produce a single table. Um, and that, that's actually a really interesting one to get that information displayed on, onto the website or whatever um, application you're using. So we have some basic attack uh, detection methods, I should say. Um, you can test for logic. So uh, here we have a page and we have a query string of ID equals one or one equals one dash dash, which is evaluated as true. We have the same and uh, we just add in this uh, uh, single quote, which then still um, can process it. So the detection, what, what we're getting at here is that I can pass this in without any single quotes, but another way I can do it is I can pass it in with that. And I'm looking for errors. I'm looking for strange behavior. Um, that maybe uh, the application will display less information or maybe display more information um, or it'll just throw back a, an error such as a stack trace or an HTTP 500 message. And at that point, I know that we're very, it's very likely we have SQL injection. So uh, we can do that with double quotes as well. We can also send information that's gonna come across as false. So it will stop the processing of information. We can perform arithmetic. So one equals one, one divided by one is true. One divided by zero is a false. So interesting piece is how SQL handles that. Uh, and if you're really just, it's a simple, I need to check and see if it's there. Breaking the string is the easiest way to find out. Breaking the string, you can do so with a, a single quote or with a double quotes. Um, and there's lots of different ways to do this, but the single quote is probably the easiest way to check for this. It's not, if, if there's no, uh, if it's, not, if it's going to strip single quotes out or if it's going to um, uh, have no need for them, uh, it may not process it correctly and may not, especially if it's using numeric information, um, you may not get valid information and that's where you can do the Boolean operators like we talked about before. But send a single quote and then you send a second single quote and the error is fixed. So the first single quote caused the error, the second single quote fixed the error. Oh, you almost certainly have SQL injection at that point. So we need to talk about how database detection works. This is important. Um, so there's a lot of different ways. We're gonna go really quick on this. So MySQL, you can tell it to sleep. You can run benchmarks, where we're actually doing a benchmark and we're doing some encoding. Uh, how fast can you encode this um, over this amount of time, which is in uh, milliseconds. You can uh, do string concatenation and the, the way the different databases do concatenation is different. So um, we can try to fig figure out what the underlying database is, uh, the database management system, I should say. So we're trying to, we can send these to MySQL and see how they respond. And one of the key giveaways is usually what kind of pages we're talking to. If we're on PHP pages, we're almost certainly using MySQL. That doesn't necessarily mean that we are, but they typically are paired together because they, they've been developed alongside each other for so long that that's a, that it's uh, common for them to have um, working integration together. Okay, so now how do we take the injection that we found, we, we've detected it, how do we go to injection? How do we look and see, is it really SQL or MySQL? Well, uh, taking advantage of the version clause, uh, or command I should say, uh, is probably the easiest way to do this. So we're, we're looking for, we're trying to select the version. We can do that with, with a union, so ID equals union, go get the version. So this is a, a, a global a resource that we can go um, request. We don't need to specify uh, what table it's in. We have a union with a subquery. You can find it that way. We can do it with a union of null. Uh, like, hey, I know that we're, we're combining some tables and we're, there's gonna be a couple, um, a couple columns. And you know what? I want the first column to be the version of MySQL and the second column to be null. I don't really care what's in it. Dash dash to continue going. So these are ways of uh, um, being able to take that and keep going. And we can do it with stack queries where you have your first query. No. 
I'm being offered beer, so uh, it's probably a bad idea right now. <laughs> it's not B-sides without beer. <laughs> um, so I'm going to hold off on the beer just for you guys. <laughs> but no promises once I'm done. That's right. Um, so in this case, we're ending a, a injection uh, or ending our, um, our SQL and command, and we're creating another statement. So we're inserting two, and we're trying to go get um, that version. Okay, DBS uh, detection for Oracle. String concatenation, okay, it works a little bit differently. So it's just important that you guys are aware of this. So we can uh, go get the default pages. And what I should have said is that we really want this version information. And if you see, there's that, um, let's go, let's, let's jump forward. Okay, yes. So we're really just looking for that V dollar sign version. That will, that's some of the giveaways that's gonna tell us. Um, the error messages will change different. That's another way to detect if we're able to just put that single quote in there and get an error message. If we know we're working with JSP files, Java server page files, um, then we, we know we know that we're almost certainly working with Oracle because Oracle and Java uh, like to go together quite well. Okay, so catching back up. So we're looking to see if we can pull the information from this V version. Uh, we can try to grab the banner. We can union the banner from the version and the banner is gonna give it away. This It's gonna make it plainly obvious what database management system we're on. Um, we can do a union uh, with the banner, uh, so the banner of uh, the version. And we can also go and um, just pull a, a null union and try to pull that information directly. Okay, there's MySQL. There's other databases, but we're covering the main ones. And I'm gonna make sure we're doing, yeah, we're doing great on time. So, all right, so there's MySQL. I'm sorry, Microsoft SQL, very important. That's a big distinction. We can tell it to wait. So we can send it a wait for 10 seconds. And if it waits for 10 seconds and we send this command over, we know we're talking to Microsoft SQL. We can send over default variables. Um, so where we're trying to get the server name. So go get the server name and return this. If you notice, once again, that is, both of these are stacked queries. So um, some of the databases operate differently and they'll, they'll treat stack queries differently. Um, Microsoft SQL is uh, a little bit harsher, but it will allow them if they're not explicitly turned off. And everything that I'm showing you are things that you can try. They may not necessarily work, um, but it's important to walk down the list because these are configuration level issues that the database needs to be able to, um, to push back on and not allow you to do. Um, again, we can send the single quote, see what the, message, the error messages say. And those are gonna be some of your best gearable ways of what's happening. Uh, another error message that you can send is send this over, um, see how he handles it. He's gonna to try to receive, retrieve a resource that he's not, maybe not allowed to be pulling and you might get an error message uh, because there was an attempt to pull it. And one of the key things is if you're working with an ASP or ASPX files, which is an ASP.NET framework, um, it's very likely you're working with Microsoft SQL. So th there's pieces, there's breadcrumbs everywhere that you can use to, to take advantage of um, understanding what you're doing. How do we inject with this? So once again, the at, at version. So we're trying to pull that, you can union with it. You can use it as a subquery. You can uh, uh, do a union, uh, union null where we're trying to uh, um, mix things because you can put together tables with other tables. Um, and if you just have null columns, you can union a null column and a null column together. That, that works just fine. Uh, you can do stack queries. Once again, check that out. At this point where we're putting the semicolon saying, stop what you're doing. And here's another, well, it doesn't mean stop what you're doing. I should be more specific. It means once you're done with that, now run this. That's a, that's a much better way to uh, look at that. So let's talk about the different types of attacks. We've talked about union, where we're actually uh, pairing one select statement with another, uh, where we union the select A and B from table one and the C and D from table two. So that can be taken advantage of. Uh, and this, you have to get the column numbers right. The number of columns have to match. So in this case, that would be two columns um, uh, that we're trying to union with. And so there's ways to walk through and see if we can find out how many tables the application is expecting. If it's expecting four, uh, let's go with an example, four um, uh, columns that be returned, four fields, then we can say, you know what, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna start this, this starts my injection, order by one and don't do anything else. 
and it'll try to order it and you probably will get a nice graceful message that says, okay, good. Then you do it again, order by two, nice graceful message. Do it again, order by three, nice graceful message. Then you go to order by four. And at this point it fails because there is no, uh, and I'm sorry, this would be three columns. Uh, there is no third, uh, fourth column. And at this point, if there's no fourth column and you can't order by that column, you would be able to generate an error and get this information back and like, aha, I have three columns that I'm working with. Here. You can do the same thing by telling it to union with nothing. <laughs> um, you can say, I'm in a union and select nothing or nothing, nothing, which is, these are once again, columns. So we're adding or handing columns over uh, and nothing, nothing. So all these three would work. And on the fourth iteration, this would fail telling us that there are only three columns. Okay, error-based injections. You're trying to cause an error. That's really what you're trying to do. So if you can cause errors, you can learn things about the database and learn where, where information is, learn how uh, the file names are or uh, the records. And you can ask information, is the first letter of this record uh, uh, an A? Or is it a B? Is it a C? And depending on uh, how it responds, you may be able to uh, send back errors and get better information to be able to work your way down. That same attack methodology works very similar on blind in injection. So there's two different types of blind injection. There's Boolean based, where we're, we're turning things on and off. We're basically sending yes and no's and trying to see how he responds. Um, and it allows us, let's say I can turn my, if something is true, if a resource is there. And remember, these are still, that we're still just trying to uh, get this to work. Um, so we may not get any indication that something is happening. A blind injection means you got a generic message back, but did you get injection? So it's, you could have an injection that's entirely blind that you don't know what's going on in the background. Um, and so Boolean blind allows you to change things on the website um, or change things on the application to indicate whether you did or didn't get something done. And another way of doing it, is time-based blind. So at this point, we're sending SQL injection, and if something is true, so if I ask for a record and I check the first letter, if it equals A, wait for five seconds. Send it again. If it's uh, B, wait for five seconds. Keep sending these over and over and over again. Once we get to K and it waits for five seconds, then at that point, um, it will wait for five seconds, and I'll know, oh, hey, Whatever this record is, it starts with a K, and then I do it again. And you have to do it for lowercase and uppercase, but it's a, it's a way to walk through things and ask questions. You can ask about the banner. You can ask all kinds of records that are throughout the, uh, uh, the SQL server and the database the tables. And you can ask these questions, and if they have it or if they know it, then they, they will process it and uh, either send you, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, either delay the, the application and you run off that. And when that occurs, this is actually injection that runs a little slow to exfiltrate data. Um, it, can, it can work, but you do it generally character by character, record by record, um, field by field, table by table. It's slow, but it works pretty well um, when it does work and there's ways of automating this. Uh, but yeah, so I'm gonna ask if a, if a record, uh, if there's a, a name equals Chris, um, and a true statement, and if what, what we were searching for is true, uh, wait for five seconds, and that will, that will give it away. So there, that was actually seeing what it looks like. Stored procedures are SQL commands, or SQL statements that are stored in SQL. And these are every bit as vulnerable to SQL injection just as well. So you can take your, your vulnerable commands uh, and statements and throw them into, um, throw them into uh, SQL and be able to uh, um, call upon them later uh, especially since we talked about second order. This, uh, this is a good example of how you can uh, take advantage of second order. Here, uh, we're coming to the end of our um, intro to SQL, and we're gonna get into the real cool stuff. Um, so we have some PHP code. We have a function, bad, it's a bad function. Uh, he has some uh, uh, setup details, some more setup details, and we have string, dynamic, SQL, select ID, name, um, B sign from users where name, equals, and then we have the string that we're, we're adding to this. We're concatenating a string. This is called string building. This is where we're adding information into the string, and we're able to take advantage of that. So in this case, then we're taking, we have a SQL request that's taking the SQL statement, and it's executing 
um, this dynamic SQL. So dynamic SQL was the string that we built here. So we are pulling, we're running that query. We're gonna see what happens and it's gonna pull from all these, uh, these setup details that we had before and see what comes by. So this allows string building. Why are we talking about string building? Because we need to talk about, if you're communicating with developers, how to stop SQL injection. Um, XKCD, excellent article, or excellent uh, comic strip, definitely. Uh, if you ever get have the time, spend some time here. Um, some, some funny stuff here, but um, essentially what this uh, comic is saying that um, you need to sanitize your databases, otherwise you know, people can have some weird names and crash your databases, drop your tables. Um, and so somebody was so enthralled by this, I should reach out to this person. Uh, they made a website called uh, Bobby Tables, so Little Bobby Tables. And uh, Little Bobby Tables is an example of how to protect yourself against all these different attacks. Um, how using different, um, different uh, defense strategies to use that, uh, these, what we're about to do, how to stop string building for the different languages. Uh, for the different systems, I would strongly encourage you to go to bobby-tables.com, have a look, uh, especially if you're a developer or a blue teamer, to know how to uh, make your system a bit more resilient. Okay, there has to be three things that need to be done. Uh, this is the, the best strategy for uh, dealing with SQL injection. Uh, we're gonna skip to parameterized queries here for a moment. Parameterized queries are ways to take a string and only pass in parameters, not, not concatenate strings, not build out the strings, it's a way that we can limit the scope of what's passed in and we can control the variables um, and we can make sure that the types are correct. Um, we can do all kinds of uh, checks on it before it gets passed in and it keeps the attacker from doing any string building. It's uh, very resilient, but you still have to pair this with a couple others. You still need known good validation. Known good validation is different than known bad validation. Known bad validation is like a blacklist, and we'll get there in a second, but known good validation means I'm only letting in the kind of data that I want to be coming into this application. Then let's say they still get SQL injection. Well, then limit what they can do. The principle of these privileges limits what, what you're able to process, limits what uh, information will be able to uh, be stolen or move uh, lateral movement throughout the database. It's important that you uh, lock down these privileges because SQL injection is really hard to stop. Um, there is no magic bullet here. Uh, these are some of the best strategies for getting around it, but um, you still need prepared uh, for, and have an environment that's ready to be um, exploited and uh, have a strategy for overcoming that. So is sanitation enough? So in this case, you know, we, we, we are simply passing in um, numeric information here. And if you look here, uh, we can pass uh, we can pass nothing. This is just a real quick example of what happens when you remove the single quote. This is not expecting a single quote. We could do it with a single quote, but you could also just pass in direct information and try to process it that way. Uh, and where we, we ask for a count number or one equals one and we get all the users. Um, sorry, all this information from the users, I should say. All right, you're trying to protect yourself you're using regex black, blacklists. And so you have a spot that email comes in, so select from the field uh, where the field equals email. Um, and so I uh, usually I like to call and response, you know, is this a valid email address? Yes, it is. Now, uh, SMTP server, uh, gmail.com is going to ignore it. It's not gonna let you do it. But an application that's using a regex filter, sure as well. They'll let you pass this through. So here's what it looks like. Where we're doing, where email equals whatever's passed in. Email is now Chris or one does not equal Gmail, and at this point, I have my injection. I'm able to cause an error because I've created a false Boolean value. All right, there's escapes. So you may say, aha, I have a way around this. I will escape information. I'll escape that first uh, injection point. Well, that's okay, I can just double, uh, I can double up on my escaping and hopefully bypass your escaping. So it's not a, uh, not a very effective strategy. Prepared statements, this is one of the most effective strategies that we covered before. We have set, we bring in a parameter and we have set it right here in the new salary. We've brought in the ID parameter and we've set it in the new salary. So we've gone and retrieved these parameters. We're pulling this information. Um, and then at this point we have a query that has placeholders. So update employees set salary placeholder where ID equals placeholder and we're passing in these placeholders into the correct placeholders, placeholder one, placeholder two, we pass them in. Now, for the eagle eyes out here, you'll notice we're pulling directly from the application uh, uh, interface. 
and passing it directly into a SQL statement. Still dangerous because we didn't do any sanitization, but this is an easy way to understand where uh, the data can come in and we can control exactly what this string will look like. You can't add on information to the string. You can't build it out. You can't make it do crazy things. Blacklist filters are easy to get around. They, let's, um, briefly, let's talk about blacklist or bypassing filters. Um, so a common piece that you want to block is this XP command shell. Um, so that was uh, usable on Microsoft SQL servers 2014 and older. And you could pass in uh, this, this command that you're really trying to do. What you're trying to tell the SQL server is run a server level command, go run the, the directory level command, so return that information. So you may try to uh, bypass it. Uh, the filter may try to uh, replace any of your single quotes with spaces. Well, just start it with an escape. It's an easy way to get around it. You can use the upper and lower characters to bypass these regex filters. So just the simple pieces like this will, will confuse it. If the blacklist filter wasn't created correctly, and this is again why I'm saying don't use blacklist filters. Um, another way to do it is that you can comment out your spaces and you can have information and uh, SQL Server, let's, let's get it out of the way. Um, SQL Server will still treat this just the same and your regex filter won't match and it'll be passed through. And that's again why you don't use blacklist filters. Let's look at some other fun ones. Concatenation, let's say I just add all my letters together. Uh -huh, that's one way to cross. Uh, let's say I know that your server is using base64 encoding and it's gonna read it that way, so I'll just encode it or may give SQL server, your SQL server, the command uh, the, um, that he has to base64 decode whatever I hand it to him. And I can put my, uh, I can put my uh, payload right here. So that's another way that you can come across that. Um, another way you can do it is with character codes. And I can send this over to your payload, uh, to your um, SQL application, and hopefully bypass your regex filters because, good lord, who does this? Who has a regex filter that, that works like that? Okay, we are to the advanced portion. So, you have SQL injection. You've determined the database. You uh, database management system. You have. You know you have SQL injection. What do you do with it? What can you do? There are a lot of different strategies here. One, you can gather information, learn a whole bunch about what's going on in the database. Um, you can do some targeted uh, um, data targeting where you're looking for very specific information in the database. You can uh, try to escalate your privileges. You can run OS level commands, if allowed. Um, you can start reading and writing from the file system, if allowed. You can uh, start moving laterally. And you can ex exfiltrate data from the environment and let's, let's go back there. Uh, and this one almost always works, exfiltrate. If you can get SQL injection, you can start exfiltrating data because you're able to see it and there's no reason why you can't record that locally yourself for uh, um, analysis at a further time. Oftentimes when you're doing these tests, um, you have a limited amount of time, especially since you're trying to be sneaky. Um, so you may exfiltrate a chunk of data and get out of there and, and try to keep it under a certain amount of time and then analyze what you, what you uh, were able to steal afterwards. When I see lateral movement, just because you come in as one user doesn't mean you can't start moving around what that user is able to do. Information gathering. Oh, okay. This is, this is a large chart. We have a lot of these charts. Um, there is not time. We have 10 minutes. There is not time for us to go through every single piece, but I want you to have an idea of your strategies. So if you're trying to do information gathering, can I pull the version? Can I pull users? Um, get a specific user? Can I go get... Um, a list of all the users? Can I get the root user? Um, can I start looking at the table schema? That's a very important place. Let's say you get SQL injection and you're like, I don't know where anything is. I don't know if there's a user's table or customer's table or a vendor's table. I don't know. So why, why don't you just ask for all the tables? You know, why don't we just do a select table schema and table names from the table information uh, schema and pr provide that information back out? You should effectively almost always do this because uh, most even low level uh, information can uh, access the schema. Most low level privilege accounts can access the schema, um, at least a good chunk of the schema. And it gives you a roadmap of where you should be moving around in your, in your attack. Uh, additionally, um, see if there's other databases from the, uh, the database schema. Uh, try to see uh, database names. Um, see if you can query another database. Uh, you can start, I mean, we're really getting into the weeds here. Uh, you can even try to read some files locally, like we, we talked about. Start gathering information. What, where are you? What are you doing? Have a better idea of how you may attack the environment. 
Oracle, the same. We can pull version, user, users, tables from all tables, um, tables from columns, uh, uh, and current databases. There's so much. This is not an exhaustive list. This is meant to be as examples of things that you can do. All these commands work. Um, and if people want uh, my slides offline, uh, definitely reach out to me. Um, I did not start off the intro with how to reach out to me, so I'll do a brief aside. Um, I'm in Slack. I'm just Chris. Um, so definitely, I'm, I think I'm, I'm the only at Chris here. So um, definitely double check that uh, and see if you can reach out to me. But I'm also, uh, I created a new uh, Twitter handle, Crossite Chris. Um, definitely reach out to me. I'm the only Crossite Chris out there. And the Chris is spelled with a K in case you guys do want to reach out to me. I'm more than happy to go over this more in depth. Um, we're, we're quickly becoming a global community. Um, definitely reach out and participate. Okay, so getting back into it. <laughs> Oracle, same thing. Uh, oh no, these are these are even more specific. So uh, working with Oracle, we can pull databases, host names, um, privileges. We, I mean, there's so much we can do. Um, so uh, there's a lot that we can do with this. Microsoft SQL, we can pull versions, users, user tables. Okay, we've seen all this. We got to keep moving. Data targeting. You can grab credit card, card data, pins, passwords, social securities. I mean, these are things that we should be browsing the uh, tables and the table, um, the column names to see if we can find. So if you can find a, a column called password, well, that's pretty good uh, indication that you, uh, that there are gonna be a bunch of passwords in there. And hopefully, hopefully they're uh, uh, password protected. Hopefully, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, we can also do uh, regex filters trying to match what information we're able to grab looking for any major credit cards. And we can also look for um, masked and unmasked social security numbers using regex filters. Uh, data targeting, uh, again, you may want some of these keywords. This is how you can build these attacks. Again, all this information is available uh, to you guys if you reach out to me directly. Uh, sensitive data. Once again, an Oracle, this is the same information we are just talking about. It's ways of attacking and looking for these re uh, resources. Uh, Microsoft SQL, same thing. We can search for all of this information uh, and look for non-default databases. So anything, this is a really valuable one. What did the, what, what other databases are they using other than the ones that are there by default? So if we can find other databases, or other tables within those databases that are not default installations, there's something gonna be interesting in those. Like, I don't care about the, um, some of the, uh, the master um, tables, the master um, databases. I don't super care about what's in those because they're gonna match and be the same for most. You might find users and other bits of information in there, but you're probably gonna more so wanna look at what's custom. What did the, data, the DBAs themselves, the database administrators create themselves? Privilege escalation. Okay, so you, you're operating as the SQL server or as a worker that can access the SQL server, uh, uh, whether it's Apache or whatnot. Can you escalate your privileges? So here in Oracle, uh, yes, you might be able to act, uh, escalate your privileges and there's some things you should be checking. Can you get the, uh, the database usernames? Can you, uh, the DBAs, can you guess their passwords? Can you create procedures that are going to uh, upgrade uh, that once somebody else runs it? that are going to upgrade your permissions. Um, can you find links that have uh, other pieces? Can you find um, queries that somebody else has created and use those to your own benefit? Uh, or create links that can do evil things once they, once they run. Uh, and then when all, all said and done, you kind of have to clean up. So can you clean up your links and uh, the things that you added to it? When you're adding things to production level SQL servers, be aware of what you're doing. You know, don't don't put pieces in here that are gonna be damaging to the organization. Um, they can be done for you, but you need to know what you're doing when you're processing this. Um, privilege escalation and Microsoft SQL. So we can come in as the DBA, we can in insert. So UNC, uh, uh, important piece that, um, that Microsoft um, systems will, will take advantage of. There's some uh, excellent, if you guys look up, this gist null binds. So, you'll find so some excellent ways to uh, take advantage of the uh, UNC path injections. Um, you can impersonate other individuals. You can create system, system admins. If they gave your account rights to create other system administrators or, or you may be a little privileged, but for some reason you can create system admins, that's a problem. Um, so you can create that and then eventually you have to clean up and you have to be able to drop those as well. 
Okay, so you've got, you, you have this ability, and you also have the ability to read from the command line. I'm sorry, from the file system. So what can you do? Okay, now this one is where things get a little screwy. Um, it really depends on what file system level access you have. It really depends on what, um, uh, what version of SQL Server you're on, what version of uh, operating system you're on. Microsoft has the ability to run these type of attacks. Um, where you so, can run things uh, as the agents uh, and run the jobs. You can start interacting with the registry. Uh, here's the classic one, the XP command shell. So there's not a whole lot to share here because it's so screwy uh, and there's not super well-defined ways of doing this. Again, I'm more than happy to provide this information if you'd like to go a little bit more in depth. Uh, OS commands, um, you can create classes, so Java classes. So what we're, we're saying, go make a Java file that we can take advantage of, or create an encoded version of the Java file. Um, well, I guess the, the, the creation is right here, it's all through hex. But really, he's gonna do things. I mean, it looks like over here, hey, we've got, we're, we're building out a pwn tool. You know, we're, we're adding in these pieces where it's gonna start reading information, uh, buffering it, and sending it to the places that we want, and then he's gonna execute it. We can, we can start operating as, um, uh, or with the ability to read and write from the uh, file system. And that's a big deal because now we can start pulling information off, especially if you have a passwords uh, text file somewhere on that machine or a configuration text file somewhere that I can go pull and really wreak havoc. Um, so again, um, we kind of got into file system. So let's go a little bit more in depth. We can dump files uh, directly to a file, or I'm sorry, dump records into a file. Um, we can go place shells, web shells, onto it and we, we can uh, uh, do all kinds of things where we're, we're injecting, there may be a portion of the application that takes information, takes code out of, I mean, it's crazy, but you can do this, takes code out of the database and inputs it into the application and then we can inject dangerous pieces right here that are effectively web shells um, where it says get information uh, that was passed into it and then, uh, and we're, we're almost out of time. Um, so we're going to wrap up here in just a second, but we can read information uh, and see what our file privileges are. Oracle is pretty weird, and Microsoft SQL requires you to have uh, transaction SQL, transactional SQL. Um, if you have these, uh, they get really weird real fast. There are some, like, like we were talking about before, there's some uh, advanced ways of doing this, but it's really system specific. It's an inf infrastructure that you're running underneath as well as the um, operating, I'm sorry, the uh, SQL database that you're running. You can move laterally. I can create users, I can drop these users. So this is MySQL, same in Oracle, same in Microsoft SQL. Uh, and then we can start doing link crawling. It's an excellent uh, blog post right here by the uh, SPI group. Uh, and, uh, and then Microsoft SQL and say, hey, what you're doing, I would need you to go connect to another um, database and uh, using your service account. And they may allow me to do that. And then data exfiltration, you're done. You've done all these horrible, nasty things. Now you need to pull information out of it. Uh, you can do that via DNS requests, um, where you can actually see the DNS. And, and if you control that, uh, the DNS of that machine, uh, of those uh, domains, you can actually see these come in. It's a way of hiding what you're doing. You can um, put things in Samba shares. You can talk to the HTTP servers. You can even do, uh, concatenate information and send it out. Um, as a good friend of mine said, you can do port tickling. Um, <laughs> Also known as port knocking. Um, Woo, port tickling. So uh, you can use some really cool ones with uh, uh, XML external entity attacks where you, you, you can dump what you want and then go retrieve it with an XXE. I mean, you can combine your exploits and there's ways of doing this. Um, Microsoft SQL. <laughs> and uh, again, many of the same ones. We have this UNC path appearing again here for Microsoft SQL that we can take advantage of. Uh, if they have send mail set up, then we start sending our, our information that we've extracted uh, to people's email. Uh, that's another way to take advantage of this. Um, there's just so many things we can do. And then finally, persistence. And this is our last couple slides. Persistence, what can you do to maintain your connection if you really want to stay in there? Um, there's a lot of really great tools. Uh, so SQL Map has their OS shell. It's great. Meterpreter, uh, you can uh, uh, create a meterpreter. You can write out your own. Uh, file uh, and have a interpreter shell and tell it to execute that. You can write your own web shells or borrow them from the internet, or you can have even stored procedures that are going to call out to you uh, every time that they get called upon. It can all be automated. I'm not going to cover this. SQL Map is an excellent uh, utility that we can use um, that a lot of a lot of tools use. 
you, if you're going to run SQL map, you need to know what you're doing. SQL map can break things. Uh, you need to be, you need to understand what you're doing before you run any automation, but it does um, take away a lot of the low hanging fruit that may be problematic. You can run web shells, you can read files. I'm not going to read all this to you. Um, and you know what, this, this is, this is older stuff. Essentially it's the number one injection on the top, OS top 10 list for a reason. You need to be aware of that. My time is done. Guys, definitely feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop. To get sacked. Uh, I'm getting sacked. We have Michael Oglesby with True Digital Security on here for our 150 interview. Oaks, can you hear me? I can. Yeah. All right. Um, well, I'll tell you what, uh, the whole point. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Uh, I just saw the, it, the YouTube channel where Chris, like, snuck up behind me so we have just a few minutes here Oaks to uh to discuss uh Mr. Oglesby sir uh to discuss uh true digital security how we can how they can help our our, our b-sides uh all all the people at, at b-sides who are watching these streams right now just uh we, we really want to know what we really want to know is how is true digital security way cooler than uh than secure ideas <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's just Sweeney. Sweeney's not in here right now, but I know Kevin's probably watching or listening somewhere. <laughs> that's just uh, that's just obvious why why we're better than Secure Ideas. <laughs> and that needs that needs no introduction or explanation whatsoever. How about how about swag? There we go. We got some we got some swag for you. Uh, yeah, I'm with Trudel Security. You know, so is so is the Joker on screen, Aaron, as well as various other people around the scene. Um, and I don't, and I don't want to do a big spiel about True Digital. Uh, you guys probably know us by now, hopefully. Um, but I do want to tell you guys about some swag if you guys haven't filled out the form. Um, unfortunately, since we can't meet in person this year, I can't give it to you uh, in person. Um, so we're going to have to do this uh, do this virtually and and through the old fashioned post office or FedEx. Um, so head on over. I posted the the link. I'll post it again in all the Slack channels. Uh, info.tujulsecurity.com slash b-sides dash swag dash contest. Um, you know, we've got boxes full of swag that we haven't been able to give out this year due to all the conferences being canceled. Uh, we've got some various types of bags, some wireless speakers and tumblers and, you know, all the, all the normal pens and pads and papers and all that. Um, you will, you know, we'll do, uh, basically we're just going to keep doing some drawings until we kind of run out of them um, once we get to the office and get them shipped out. Uh, so we'll notify everyone who, who's won. I think they've been sent me a, a couple of people's names already. Who's already been winning? Uh, Mark Donnelly and Christopher Perez. A couple of winners already. We're going to keep doing some more drawings as well throughout the day and, and you know, essentially just whenever. Um, so check your, check your email either later today or tomorrow uh, or shoot me a message if you don't see anything. Um, you will have to obviously give us uh, some sort of address to, to ship this stuff to. You know, once the winners, you'll have to be able to find us some sort of physical address, or or we'll figure out a way to figure out a way to get it to you. Has a guy named Aaron Moss won yet? Because I would like some true digital security swag. Uh, that's incorrect, sir. You will not be getting any swag whatsoever. This company. Um. Yeah, I think mean, just that's uh, just it. I think when I, I want to give my thanks to everyone at B sides, all of the organizers for continuing to put this conference on. It's been a good day so far. Uh, conference has been going well. Just appreciate all of your hard work through this trying time of of a bunch of volunteers trying to put on a uh, security conference during this COVID pandemic. Uh, not an easy thing, but uh, kudos to everyone so far. So, so for many of you who don't know, uh, Mr. Michael Oglesby here actually is one of the co-founders as well of Besides Oklahoma, but he's too cool for school now and just leaves it to, to us to take care of it now. So, uh, by the way, I hope you guys can hear me okay. Um, and it's, it is pronounced swag, Jeremiah, just so you know. That's, there's a, there is a, a C-H in there between the S and the W, just so everybody's aware. It is pronounced swag.